Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. This is one of over a thousand programs we've done since the pandemic began, and we're doing it virtually as well. We have Sean Carroll here from Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, to discuss his book, Quanta and Fields, uh, the biggest ideas in the universe. Um, we're not thinking small here today. <laughs> and it's the second book about the biggest ideas in the universe. How many books will there be before you cover all the biggest ideas in the universe? It only takes three. That's the good news. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, first, I'd like to welcome uh, people from Wonderfest and uh, their assistants in this. Uh, and I, let me introduce you to Professor Sean Carroll. Um, he's a theoretical physicist uh, and a professor, in addition to the fact that he wrote this book and the one before it on the biggest issues. Um, he is the Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy at Johns Hopkins University and the Fractal Faculty at Santa Fe Institute. He also hosts the Mindscape podcast. He received his PhD from Harvard University and has spent his time focused on issues related to dark matter, dark energy, space-time symmetries, and the origins of the universe. So, big ideas, and we're going to discuss them today. You know, your, your book of, uh, is, is fascinating for its uh, clear prose and mathematics. And so it, it's actually kind of possible to read it without the mathematics, but the, you have more mathematics than, the, than some books that try to eliminate the mathematics from it, you know? And so I was wondering if you could tell us, so how do you perceive the, your audience for the book? I mean, that's a great question because I've always thought that we collectively as writers and publishers and so forth kind of try to homogenize the audience in our minds. We imagine that there is a kind of person for whom you're writing, but I think the actual audience is very heterogeneous. There's like different kinds of readers out there with different kinds of interests. So this book is for these books, the series, are for people who just want a little more detail, a little more specificity, a little more look under the hood mm -hmm. of how physics actually works. And if you're gonna do that, you need to show the math. There's kind of a gap between popular level discussions that are all pictures and metaphors and analogies, mm -hmm. and then textbooks that assume you're gonna be a professional physicist someday. So I'm fine falling inside that uh, gap that there's not a lot of books trying to reach people. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, I thought very, very interesting. And I, as I said just before we started, uh, I thought it was great that you showed, as you said, you look under the hood and say, this is where we really don't understand something. This is where we're working on it. Um, but I kind of want to go right to the end of your book, um, where you say, we should be really proud of what we know. Because if you, you go back 200 years, almost none of the pieces, uh, maybe mass and, 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 and energy, et cetera, but very few of the pieces of how we look at things now were there. And th that's both very interesting and also gives you pause because you really don't know 200 years from now whether those pieces will still be there or not. But <laughs> it seems like we have a very good idea. So why don't you talk about where we've arrived at? And then we'll go back and pick up the pieces and, 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 and talk about what's going on in physics today. Well, this is a fascinating question at a philosophical level, because you're absolutely right that our picture of what the universe is made of at the deepest level, which is the subject of this book, Quantum Mechanics and Quantum Field Theory, it didn't exist a couple hundred years ago. And so we've clearly changed very dramatically what our picture is. But something has been maintained. It's still true that apples fall from trees. Mm -hmm. It's still true that we can predict the eclipses and how the planets go around the sun. So we often go through this sort of weird kind of transformation in fundamental physics where we completely change our ideas about what is the fundamental stuff of the universe, mm -hmm. but still the successful parts of what works at the higher level we're able to keep. And that was very much the philosophy behind writing this book. I wanted to stick to things that would still be thought of as true 500 years from now. Mm -hmm. Even if we think that they're true for very different reasons, if we, even if we have very different underlying ideas, what a philosopher would call the ontology of the theory, what the theory says exists at the fundamental level, that might change. Mm -hmm. But it will still be true that there are atoms, 
it will still be true that atoms have electrons in them and protons and neutrons. So I wanted to stick to that stuff, the stuff that we have firmly established and it's not going to go away. All right, so let's go to one big question that I have about atoms, since they're, they're the thing that has lasted. And we, we have Democritus's theory from more than 2,500 years ago that there had to be some discrete, indivisible uh, particle. Okay? Now, that was identified as the atom in the early 20th century, right? And we, we picked it out as the subset of, of molecules, basically. And that there are, we have the periodic table now of what atoms are. Do you think that that word, atom, as we use it now, is the same idea that Democritus had before? Sadly, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's a good answer. <laughs> it's it's going to be it's going to be subtle sometimes. Yeah. You know, Democritus's original argument in favor of atoms was pure reason, right? It was mm -hmm. not based on experiment. He he did not have any technology that would enable him to notice that the world is in fact made of atoms. That didn't really come along until, like you say, the early 20th century. It was the 19th century when scientists became convinced that atoms exist for somewhat indirect reasons. When you combined tin and oxygen, there were different ratios that you got coming out that just made more sense if there were fundamental particles of tin and oxygen. And so the, in some sense, yes, he was right. There are atoms of tin, there are atoms of oxygen, there are atoms of hydrogen, et cetera. But in another sense, now that we understand quantum mechanics, we know that those atoms are not really the fundamental thing. You know, I mean, not only because there are protons and neutrons inside and then quarks and gluons inside the protons and neutrons, but because as you'll discover by reading the book, Quantum mechanics talks about things in a very different way than particles. It talks about waves and wave functions and quantum fields. And the atoms, the particles kind of show up when we look at nature in a certain way. It's very much a question of what we observe, not what is really going on underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. So you kind of need both. You need the smooth fundamental waviness that quantum mechanics talks about and you need that particle-like discreteness that you get when you measure something. Mm -hmm. So, follow-up question on that one. Is it possible that we misnamed what we call the atom and that this is not the, the indivisible, because it's divisible, that we've named something at the level of, of structure in the, in, in, in the particles, like molecules, we call them atoms, but actually, something that's indivisible, like you mentioned, um, I think uh, photons and, and a few other particles are, are, are not really divisible. They can't be, they're, they're as light as possible. They don't have any inter... I, I look at it as, if you say it's an indivisible particle, it would mean it wouldn't have any parts. If it has any right. parts, you, you can rip it apart. So if something doesn't have a part, that seems to me, and then that's uh, quite a few levels of... of uh, uh, exponential levels down below where we call atoms, where the indivisibility comes in. So maybe we misnamed yeah, it. it. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And happily for physicists, we can blame the chemists for jumping the gun <laughs> on this one. Um, you know, the, the chemists in the 19th century realized that they could better understand the rates of different chemical reactions mm -hmm. and the amount of products that you produced if different chemical elements came in discrete particles. And mm -hmm. so they called them atoms. And that's what we said, atoms of tin, atoms of oxygen, and, and, and so forth. And that was a little premature mm -hmm. because they didn't know whether those atoms were truly indivisible or not. And as it turns out, the chemists uh, uh, were a little bit wrong. And the physicists showed that in fact, atoms are made of smaller particles. Like you said, electrons, protons, neutrons. We now know that the protons and neutrons are made of other particles called quarks and gluons. We don't think that there's much room for lower levels. We don't think that it's turtles all the way down. We mm -hmm. have been looking. People have had theories about could electrons or quarks be made of smaller particles, mm -hmm. but the theories don't work as far as we can tell. So our tentative 
conclusion is that the quarks and the electrons really are fundamental particles, but we shouldn't be so presumptuous as to name them atoms. We, we just don't <laughs> quite know yet. <laughs> Great. All right. Now, you, you, you make some pretty... But we'll, we'll, let's go into fields for a second because it's, it's a big part of your book. Um, and, and I think a part of the mystery for people outside, it, it seems a lot easier to work with little marbles than it does to work with fields. So, um, but you say that the, f the fields are, are the fundamental stuff of the universe, not, not the particles. Now, I know that's difficult to explain, but in, because are fields, I guess there's this big question, are fields a mathematical map of, of what's going on, or is it what's going on? Is quantum mechanics a mathematical map of what's going on that gives great, great answers? Or is, it, or is it what really is going on and what we see is a kind of mistake in a way? So anyway. As far as we know, it is what is going on. There are controversies here, as you said when we started talking, because physicists and philosophers don't agree on what quantum mechanics is actually saying. Mm -hmm. But we think that reality actually is doing these things that the mathematical models tell us. So it's very, very hard for us to wrap our brains around this because the world as it is suggested to us by quantum mechanics is a very non-intuitive world mm. to us. It's very different than what we experience in our everyday life. And that makes sense. In our everyday life, the world is closely modeled by classical mechanics that was invented by Isaac Newton hundreds of years before. And the need for these quantum phenomena, like superpositions and entanglement and so forth, is completely absent in our day-to-day -day experience. So we have trouble really thinking in a deeply quantum mechanical way. But as physicists, our job is to describe how nature actually is. We describe it using the language of mathematics because that works very well. Mm -hmm. But the thing we're describing is nature. And so I, I think that in my, in my own personal view, mm -hmm. when we talk about these quantum mechanical theories, we are doing our best to capture what nature really is at the deepest level. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now you talked about entanglements. So and that's another thing you, you cover a lot, and I, I, I find it fascinating, like everybody does, um, that goes into this stuff anyway. Um, it, the question I have, or one of the many questions I have about entanglement is, if you, you I had a, you, you, uh, I'll just tell you, when reading your book. So I read your book, I was reading the thing about entanglements, and I thought, okay, so, you know, if you start with people with red shirts and blue shirts and then, and then you know, you, you spin them this way or this, and then you, you, or, or you put them both in a box and then you uncover one and you find it's blue, then you know that the other one is red. But you're, and, and just a couple pages later, you said, but that's not what we mean by entanglement. So I right. thought that was perfect right away. You know, you answered my question very quickly with only a slightly different analogy. Um, and, uh, but my question is, if, if we're, all these quantum entanglements are being caused all the time, between particles. Why after, let's just say 14 billion years, why isn't everything all tangled up? That, that, every, that, that every particle is somehow entangled with the other ones and, and this is, I know that it can be de disentangled, but in general, why isn't there more tangling? Yeah, no, that's a great question, but there's two things to say here. One is that entanglement is one of these words that physicists borrow from the english language that means something different to physicists mm -hmm. than to other people entanglement is not some kind of tangible connection like a rope or a ribbon that ties particles together you can't pull on one entangled particle and see it move the other entangled particle around. It's a kind of relationship at the quantum level that helps us predict various measurement outcomes when we go to measure the particles. And that measurement process in quantum mechanics has a special place. You know, we always measure things, whether it's classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, but in classical physics, you can imagine measuring things very delicately. You can measure them as unobtrusively obtrusively as you like. Whereas in quantum mechanics, measurements change the nature of the system inevitably and in large ways. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the world doesn't seem more entangled to us is because we're constantly looking at it. 
Mm-hmm. And when I say we, I don't mean people. You know, there's nothing about consciousness or awareness or anything like that. The world, parts of the world are constantly bumping into other parts of the world. And for all intents and purposes, they are measuring it. Mm-hmm. So as soon as you measure one particle that had been entangled with another one, that entanglement goes away. And so, yes, you build up lots of entanglements throughout time. You destroy them just as quickly. I see. Okay. Great answer. Um, one of the things about this idea that, that the measurement problem that you, you go into, that, that most people that go into this field are aware of this big problem, in, 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 uh, is that <clears throat> we're working with, especially if we're working with what might be called the original Democritus's atom, that is an indivisible particle and extremely, whatever the tiniest thing is, that's where it is. Um, it, it's like we, we measure things or we, we know about them by throwing billions of small things against something that's big. Like, but if I was trying to understand something about you, I wouldn't throw myself against you. That wouldn't work very well to get, to yep. get any information. And so if you're talking about the tiniest things, by, by nature, we won't be able to throw something off of it and find out. We have to make conclusions about other effects and everything. So why don't you talk about that part of the problem of where uncertainty comes from and everything. Yeah, you know, that's exactly right. And it's a fundamental insight into how science works Mm -hmm. in general. You know, scientists and historians of science and philosophers of science love to tell stories that don't really map onto the reality of how science gets done, which is very messy. You know, there's no algorithm, there's no procedure, there's not even a straightforward scientific method, really. Mm. What there is is a give and take between scientists and nature. And scientists will invent theories and they will do experiments and they wanna see the whole system all at once. You have a whole theoretical structure that makes lots of different predictions and you have a whole bunch of experimental data and you wanna say which of the possible theoretical structures that we can imagine fits all of the data or at least as much of the data as we can imagine. This is why when you get one experiment that goes against a very, very well-established theory, you don't throw away the theory Mm -hmm. because there's a good chance that either the experiment is wrong Mm -hmm. or we will figure out a way to accommodate that experiment within the theory that we know. And this is absolutely like you're getting at the only way to work at the level of fundamental physics. You don't take photographs Mm -hmm. of electrons in atoms because if you did try to do it, you would dramatically change the state of the electron. What you can do is do various measurements over and over again on many atoms and build up a picture. This is analogous to what they do at a place like the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Mm -hmm. giant particle accelerator where they smash particles together over and over again. When they discovered the Higgs boson in 2012, it wasn't because they got it exactly right at a single event. Mm -hmm. They smashed two protons together and a Higgs boson popped out. That's not how it works. (laughs) You never see the Higgs boson. What you see is that if you smash the particles together with an exactly certain amount of energy, you're more likely to make certain reaction products than you otherwise would. It's a very indirect kind of thing. But a physicist will say it's indirect, but it fits this particular theory really, really well, and it doesn't fit any other theories, so we're gonna go with that. It it, it reminds me of also the example in your book um, of how they demonstrated, how science experiments demonstrated that there was a core nucleus in the atom by by you know you bounce a bunch of things off of it and every once in a while and and therefore it must be tightly compacted why don't you talk about that for a second so how how that was discovered and when because i think that's interesting because we're very early on it was very early on early night early uh 20th century ernest rutherford uh who was a new zealander who had moved to cambridge england and he was a brilliant experimental physicist who just made discovery after discovery was really one of the most important people in putting together the modern picture of the atom. And the trick here is to sort of put yourself in the mindset of someone who was a physicist at that time, right? Like 1910 or something like that. So we knew about atoms, we knew about electrons, and we knew that electrons were much tinier than atoms, but were inside them. That's basically all we knew, okay? So what is the structure of an atom 
like? Where is the electron? Where is whatever else there is? The, the electric charge on an electron is minus one. The electric charge of an atom is zero. So there has to be some positive charge somewhere. Mm -hmm. And atoms are much heavier than electrons. So there has to be some heavy, positively charged thing. And the leading theory at the time was what's called the plum pudding model mm -hmm. of the atom. <laughs> uh, your British listeners British, will yes. <laughs> understand that reference, but the Americans might not. But think of raisin bread, right? You know, think of something that has some large uh, extent, where here large means the size of an atom. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that the electrons were the plums or the raisins, these little dots moving in the large amorphous blob. And so what Rutherford did is he wanted to test this idea. So he took high energy particles, alpha particles, and he shot them at a very, very thin sheet of gold foil. The idea of the thinness of the sheet was maybe you can sort of probe one atom at a time. Mm -hmm. And the prediction was the heavy particles that he was shooting would mostly go right through. Occasionally, they would be deflected by a little bit. So you imagine they pass right through the plum pudding, right? And mm -hmm. they're not moved around very much in that process because the, the plum pudding is not solid. It's sort of amorphous. But what actually happens is he got some of those high energy particles that he shot shooting right back at him. Mm -hmm. Completely surprising. He said it was like shooting a cannonball at a piece of paper and it comes back mm, directly yeah. at you. What What is going on? <laughs> so he came up with this idea that it's not like a amorphous blob of plum pudding, that the positive charge in a nucleus is a heavy, massive, small thing sitting at the center. The thing that we now call the nucleus of the atom and the electrons around that are further away. It's like a little solar system. The, the nucleus is like the sun and the electrons are like the planets. Mm -hmm. Now, quantum mechanics changed that picture again, but still the basic idea of a small, heavy nucleus is still with us. Yeah. And I, I love that story because it's a great example of what you were saying before. How do, do physicists go about learning things? because that wasn't what they were expecting to learn, you know, learn something different than what they were expecting. Exactly, and the evidence can, to, a, to someone who isn't embedded in the discourse, seem kind of flimsy. You're okay. saying, okay, you shot some particles at a piece of gold foil, mm -hmm. and some of them bounced right back at you, and therefore you have a deep insight into the nature of the atom? <laughs> <laughs> this seems to be like a bit of an extrapolation, doesn't it? Yeah. But <clears throat> the point is that you know the evidence builds up. You do more and more experiments, and you discard the theories that don't work, and the ones that work get stronger and stronger. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to remind our audience that you can ask questions of Sean directly yourself if you use the YouTube uh, chat room uh, to send them and we'll look at them and we'll get to those in maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, so uh, <laughs> that example reminds me of something else, of course, that you write about, and which is a, a lot of times people say uh, or get the impression in pop uh, physics that there's, it's all empty space. And, and that there's really no reason uh, everything can go through. And we know that from neutrinos, neutrinos go right through everything. So that, right. that can be one thing that gives us the impression that there's this space. But you explain exactly why that's not really true. And I thought it was a very good explanation of that. So why don't you explain why it's not just empty space that we're sitting in and why our world is a solid world? Well, it goes back to this question of how we think about the quantum nature of reality. That picture that Rutherford came up with, mm. that the atom looks like a little solar system, that's a beautiful picture. It's still, you know, used as the icon for physics everywhere, or even for science, right? The little cartoon picture of the atom. Mm. But quantum mechanics comes along and says, electrons are not little points. Mm. They're not like little peas or plums or anything like that. They're not like planets in the solar system. We describe electrons using a wave. Sadly, we have a very boring name for this wave. It's called the wave function of the electron. <laughs> very boring name. I'm very sorry that they missed the chance to come up with a more <laughs> dramatic kind of terminology for this. But the wave function, if you ever studied chemistry in high school or college, you see all these pictures of what are called the orbitals mm -hmm. of electrons in atoms. You know, Some of them are perfectly spherical. Some of them have little lobes or rings or whatever. 
And those orbitals are the shapes that the wave function can take inside an atom. And to me, the important conceptual shift is the following. That what, what the wave function does in one way of talking is it predicts the probability that you would measure the electron to be here or there. Where the wave function is large, if you were to measure it, there'd be a large probability of seeing it there. And likewise, when it's small, the probability is low. So we human beings think in our anthropocentric way that what matters is what we see when we look at things. Mm -hmm. But when you're not measuring it, the electron is not located somewhere. The wave function is not, or I should say quantum mechanics is not saying the electron is somewhere we just don't know where. And all I will tell you is the probability. Quantum mechanics is saying the wave function is what the electron is when you're not looking at it. And it is taking up space inside the atom. That's the reason why matter is solid, because atoms bump into each other. If atoms were really like little solar systems, they would go right through each other. They're mostly empty space, right? right. And physicists mostly know this, but they don't always communicate it correctly to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So that's a great analogy, because the solar systems would, would uh, pass through each other and maybe not hit anything. Um, yeah, and, very likely not. Yeah, and, and even <laughs> galaxies, you know, seem to get, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of one galaxy survives when it goes into another one because it never hits anything, but it gets pulled into the, into the framework of the, of the uh, gravitational pull and it, it, all the different p pieces of it survive. It doesn't look like it used to, but. Well, indeed, the Andromeda galaxy, which is a close neighbor of the Milky Way, is coming our way. Mm -hmm. And in a billion years, these two galaxies are going to collide with each other. And it won't matter to us here on Earth. If we're still around a billion years from now, our lives will go on as usual. There will be somewhat more stars in the sky. But we're not <laughs> going to suffer any conclusion and any um, collisions that disrupt our ecosystem in any way. Yeah. Um, so, and it's not, you're sort of saying it's the wave function. It's not that there's a different electric charge between different atoms and that's, they spin off of each other. It's not that either. It's a, that, that it's really filled with this wave function. I thought that was very interesting. So- Yeah, and I, I think, you know, look, not every, I try to be careful, not yeah. every physicist would agree with that. Right. Uh, so I'm giving a perspective, but I think it's the right perspective. I don't think that the ones who disagree have really thought through the difficulty of explaining why matter is solid. It's kind of a very fundamental thing you have to explain as a working physicist. And you, you, I think that you, you gave three examples of theories that, that are current at the present time, but this one is the one that is most accepted sort of thing. So just to throw that in there, because you, you, do, you do always say those kind of things in your book, which I, I find also uh, very useful to outsiders to see, oh, we're still arguing about this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes when I write a book, um, like my previous book before the Biggest Ideas series, I wrote a book called Something Deeply Hidden about quantum mechanics. And um, in that book and in other books, I am trying to make an argument. I'm trying to add fuel to the intellectual discussion that people have about things we disagree about. So I'm not trying to give equal time to every possible view. I'm trying to explain the view that I think is right. But in these books, I'm very, very explicitly trying to give the consensus view. I'm trying to, like I said, stick to things that we still are gonna believe 500 years from now. And the right way to talk about the foundations of quantum mechanics is not something about which there is any consensus view. So I very briefly mentioned the possibilities and then I say, we got to, you know, move on. We got to be hard nosed working physicists here. We can't get stuck or we'll turn into philosophers or something like that. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> so um, uh, one tangential question then, um, because you, you obviously uh, do a lot of cosmology, too. That was your other book and you do dark matter and dark energy. So you mentioned the many worlds uh, theory just in one sentence and didn't say anything else about it. Now, I know it wasn't the topic of the book, but now is that because you're not so convinced by that or, or uh, that's an alternative theory that you don't find so convincing or? 
No, it's because I wrote 100,000 words about it in my previous All right. book that okay. everyone reads. <laughs> that takes care of it. Very, very um, <laughs> optimistic about that, but I'm trying to be fair. You know, it's the difference between um, being a politician trying to convince someone to vote for their party versus being a political scientist trying to analyze the dynamics of different parties. Here, here I'm being the political scientist. Okay, great. All right, um, let's talk about wave particle, uh, the wave particle theory. Now, that's been an argument for a long time now. Um, are they waves, are they particles? And just, you know, how much of it, and I know by the way you explained it that you're not gonna buy this argument, so I, I, I'm, that's why I'm setting you up to, to shoot it down here. But if you just step back from anything that you do, almost anything can look like a wave and or a particle. Um, like it said, it was, came up with photons first, but then electrons were found like that. And if you could step back from the solar system and the Earth is jiggling because of the moon going around it and the, it's, they're both going around the sun and you step back far enough and the sun's going around the galaxy, that would look like a wave function too. And we, we treat them as particles living on them. So, so um, in what way is that analogy not appropriate to, to the quantum level? Because you're, there's a difference between what's large and what's small, and you, you explained it, but I, I thought it was very useful to, to everybody who imagines these things the way I just did to, to think that way. Why'd you explain? Yeah, I think there's a couple things going on here. One is that, of course, when you think about the position of the Earth around the sun being pushed around, even at the classical physics level, there's always uncertainties in what we talk about. We don't know anything with precise godlike accuracy, but that's different than what happens in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics says it's not that you don't know everything. Even if you knew everything, the Earth would still be described as a wave in quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics goes on to say, when you look at it, when you measure it, when you observe it, you see it look like a particle, whether it's the Earth or whether it's an electron. Mm -hmm. This is the fundamental thing that makes quantum mechanics hard, that what we see when we look at things is different than what they behave like when we're not looking at them. But I also have to say that this is a particular area where popular level discussions of quantum mechanics can be very, very frustrating because they will explain to you here are the situations where matter behaves in particle-like ways, here are the situations in which it behaves like a wave. So which is it? Mm -hmm. And they seem to not say the obvious next thing, which is it's a wave. Like we know this, yeah. this is not a controversy. <laughs> this is not an actual ongoing puzzle that we don't know the answer to. We know the answer to this one. Mm -hmm. It's a wave, except that when you measure it, you don't see the wave. You see something particle-like. That's it. When you don't look waves, when you look particles. That's about as brief and clear as you can get. Um, you, you did mention when we were talking before that you, you, you went to a conference on the nature of consciousness, so I guess we're not going to uh, go too far afield here on another uh, <laughs> thing. But um, when I read, you, you talked about the, uh, the unexcited state where K equals zero, being the vacuum state of energy. And then you mentioned that at that point, for the mathematics, obviously, that the wavelength is infinite. Have you run into the people who say that that proves that that's where uh, creation comes out of nothing, that infinite wavelength is the source of the creation of everything? That, you know, that's I like the consciousness into... idea that, yeah, I, that's, that's one of those ideas from quantum mechanics that has taken on a new life altogether, so. I run into so many people with so many ideas that I cannot <laughs> keep a very detailed list of all the um, claims that I've heard. <laughs> You know, I do think it's important as physicists to explain what it is we know, to be very honest, if you want to, about advocating for a position that is not the consensus position. I'm very willing to do that when it is um, the, what I'm trying to get across, but also to be very clear about what we don't know or what we don't agree on. Mm -hmm. Questions about the creation of the universe the only once and for all final answer that you can give today is we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether the universe had a beginning or whether it's eternal. We don't know whether the Big Bang was that beginning or whether the beginning happened earlier. We don't know whether a theory of quantum gravity is gonna give us the right answer. We have ideas. We have really fun, interesting, and plausible 
ideas, but we don't know. So it's a free country. Everyone is entitled to their own theory. That's great. <laughs> but they're not entitled to think that we know whether their theory is right or not. Speaking of that, the Big Bang. So in popular uh, cosmology, everyone has heard it's the beginning of the universe and, it, it, and maybe it came out of nothing or whatever. Um, but and, and that we, what's meant, I think, by a lot of physicists, we can't measure past that point. But if, if there were let's say there's a black hole and we know about black holes and, and, and what they're like and then a black hole explodes and, and sh sh sheds everything so like a mini, a mini Big Bang then maybe we could know something about what happened in that black hole before the explosion by the momentum of the objects coming out I mean we do that a lot so is that a possibility by, I mean I know that we haven't been able to get that close yet but it, it, it would be a possibility to see past the Big Bang in just the same way that we could see past that explosion of a, of a black hole, of a small black hole. Or, well, it is possible because we don't know what right. actually happens. But this is a situation where we do have pretty reliable theories about what it would look like from the outside mm -hmm. when a black hole evaporated away and exploded. We don't, <coughs> excuse me, we don't have a complete theory about what's going on inside the black hole mm -hmm. as it is shrinking. So for those of people in the audience who don't know, in the 1970s, Stephen Hawking showed that black holes are not perfectly black. Mm -hmm. They give off radiation and therefore they lose energy and shrink. And in a finite amount of time, they will shrink away to nothing called the evaporation of the black hole. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happens inside while that is going on. And we have no way of knowing. We have no way of seeing or observing. If you dove in, maybe you could do some experiments, but then you could never tell the outside world what yeah. you'd measure. Okay. So we'll leave that in the unknowns. Yep. <laughs> um, let's uh, talk about the quanta again. So we're talking about quanta uh, as, as the main topic, plus fields. How did you go? I mean, in physics basically went from quanta and particles to fields. So, and, and now consider these fields to be the reality. So I, I found your description of that transition very interesting. You want to have a-, a Yeah, it took a, a, a while for us yeah. to get there, but yeah. it, was a, it was a real triumph, I think, because in the late 1800s, you would have been forgiven, had you been a working physicist, for thinking that we were almost done mm -hmm. with physics, right? We had this, broad framework given by classical mechanics that Isaac Newton had laid down for us. And we had discovered the electric field and the magnetic field of electromagnetism. James Clark Maxwell came up with a set of equations that well describes it. We thought we understood gravity. Pierre-Simone Laplace showed that we can also think of gravity as a field stretching through space. So a field is just the opposite of a particle, right? A particle has a location, a field is everywhere and has some value everywhere. So we'd also found like electrons. And as you mentioned before, we knew about atoms. So in the late 1800s, you could have thought that we were homing in on a picture where matter is made of particles like electrons and atoms or whatever forces between those particles are mediated by fields, like the gravitational field, the electromagnetic field, and so forth. And quantum mechanics messed all that up for a while until finally, you know, in the late 1920s, we more or less understood quantum mechanics, but we had been thinking about quantum mechanics. If you were, you know, the top quantum mechanics people in the 1920s, Heisenberg and Schrodinger and so forth, they were thinking about the quantum theory of particles, mm -hmm. electrons in particular, their, their touchstone was how do electrons behave in atoms? That's the experimental data that they wanted to reconstruct. And so they, there's a thing you can do and you are trained to do as a young physicist, which is to take a classical theory and convert it into a quantum mechanical theory. Mm -hmm. This process is actually not very respectable, but what well, we teach it to our students anyway. <laughs> and so we talk about the quantum theory of particles. Mm -hmm. And that's what Schrodinger and Heisenberg, et cetera, were developing. But we knew that there were also fields. We knew there was gravity, we knew there was electricity and magnetism. Mm -hmm. So it was a very natural thing to try to take the classical theory of fields that Maxwell had worked out 
and turn it into a quantum mechanical theory. So go from electrodynamics to quantum electrodynamics. And what we discovered along the way is you can do that. There's some mathematical trickiness, but that's okay, you can do it. And the amazing thing is that even though you start with fields and you make a wave function of those fields, so it's a wave upon a wave in some sense, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, when you measure it, when you have a detector, when you look at it, you see particles. Mm -hmm. So the particles are not the fundamental things. They pop out of the field theory applied to the rules of quantum mechanics. So in that case, it's natural to say, well, maybe the electron is like that also. Maybe the electron is a wave in a quantum field and it just looks like a particle to us. So indeed, that is exactly what people figured out. So it's a wonderful example of what physicists love more than anything, which is unification. Mm -hmm. Two different ideas were shown to be explained by one bigger idea. Mm -hmm. You had classical particles and classical fields. They're both explained by quantum mechanical fields, which is one of the great triumphs of 20th century science. Yeah, and more than one person worked on it. Oh my goodness, I, mean, <laughs> I give a talk about this, I make that joke. I say, you know, I gave a talk on book one of the biggest ideas and I basically get to talk about Einstein. You know, he had friends who helped him, but Einstein was the towering figure who worked out the theory of general relativity, the theory that says that gravity is the curvature of space time. So I thought, you know, for this talk about quanta and fields, I would show pictures of the people who developed quantum field theory in the standard model of particle physics. So I show a slide where I've written down their names mm -hmm. and it's, I don't know, a hundred names or something like that. And yeah. I, I apologize to the audience. I'm like, I'm not gonna download the hundred pictures of all these people, <laughs> but it took a lot of people mm -hmm. working very hard to put this picture together. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, in the popular um, press, of course, the discovery of the Higgs boson was a big deal. Um, and you mentioned a little bit earlier that, that you, you don't really see the Higgs boson, but you see the, the effect under certain circumstances and the exact amount of energy that's required. Um, it doesn't last very long in its, in its state. It, it, it dissolves into other pieces. Um, and it seems weird in the pop situation uh, just looking at it to say how can something be fundamental that lasts such a short amount of time but it's a piece of the mathematical puzzle so why don't you explain why everybody was searching for something that was so um well the higgs boson is a great example of why field theory quantum field theory is the way that we think about nature at the deepest level right now because it's not the boson that is very important. Like you said, the Higgs boson, the particle that we actually found evidence of in 2012 with the Large Hadron Collider, it comes into existence and then it decays into other particles with a lifetime of about one zeptosecond, which is 10 to the minus 21 seconds, a very, very short period of time, far too fast to ever be captured by any of our detectors. What we see is not the Higgs boson directly, but the other particles into which it decays. So you're absolutely right to say, how can that possibly affect our lives? Hmm. And the answer is it's not the boson not the particle that is affecting our lives, it's the field, the Higgs field lurking in the background. Mm -hmm. And that's because the Higgs field does something that as far as we know, no other fields do in the standard model of particle physics, which is when you're in empty space, when you're out there in between the planets and you imagine like you'd have a little cubic centimeter of space where there's nothing there at all, okay? It's, it's what physicists would call the vacuum. Mm -hmm. So there's still field in empty space, but the fields are essentially zero, right? There's an electric field, there's a magnetic field, there's all these fields that make particles like electrons and quarks and so forth. The fields are there. The fields have a value at every point, but the value is basically zero, maybe with small fluctuations around it, except for the Higgs field. Mm -hmm. The Higgs field has a non-zero value, in fact, a whopping big value, even in empty space. It turns out through the math that the energy that you would have in empty space would be larger if the Higgs field were zero than if the Higgs field has its actual lower energy value. So 
fields in empty space like to fall down to their lowest energy states. Mm -hmm. The Higgs is special because its lowest energy state is to not be zero. Mm. And therefore, it's there in the background, and it affects all the other particles that move through it. It affects the W and Z bosons that carry the weak nuclear force. It makes the weak nuclear force short range, which is exactly what the experiments see. Mm -hmm. And of course, it helps other particles like electrons and quarks become massive. Due to the symmetries in the standard model, they would all have to have zero mass if it weren't for the Higgs boson living there in empty space. So it's a great example of a mathematical idea, an abstract physical concept that was first you know, imagined in 1964, mm -hmm. right? A very long time ago, but it was so good of an idea. It was so robust that despite decades of efforts from other people trying to do better, than that idea. They couldn't do it, and eventually we found it, and you know, Nobel Prizes were handed out all along, all around. So basically what you're saying is that particles have a very good PR firm, and fields don't have as good a <laughs> PR firm yet, because we all talk about the Higgs particle. We don't talk yeah. about the Higgs field. The Higgs field is the real thing. I mean, it is the, is the big part of the picture anyway. That is exactly what I'm saying, and I think that this is why I say that this book, Quanta and Fields, is the book that I've been wanting to write for a couple decades now, because quantum field theory is at the heart of modern physics, and we don't talk about it that much in the popular um, discourse. We talk about quantum mechanics, and sometimes you get the sort of lurking feeling the quantum field theory is a successor to quantum mechanics. It's what comes after quantum mechanics. But that's not exactly right. It's a version of quantum mechanics. It's quantum mechanics applied to fields rather than to particles. And what you get out of the mathematics is that those fields obeying the rules of quantum mechanics look like particles when you measure them. So we're happy with particles. We start talking about them. We take pictures of them in our detectors. And that's exactly what we talk about indeed. We call ourselves particle physicists when we do this for a living. <laughs> but really, it is the fields that are more fundamental. And when you want to understand why the particles have the properties they do, you have to think about the underlying fields. Well, we're going to pick up a couple of questions from the audience here um, and then maybe come back. But uh, first question is, can you please explain the disentanglement mechanism? Does the process happen via decoherence? Good. Someone has been uh, reading out of school, of course. Um, <laughs> yes. The, the rough answer is yes. Of course, this is precisely what is called the quantum measurement problem. Mm -hmm. When you have a quantum mechanical system, we describe quantum systems like Schrodinger's cat or like an electron in an atom as being in a superposition of different possible measurement outcomes. Like a very good example that we use over and over again is the spin of an electron. An electron with respect to some axis might be spinning either clockwise or counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. And we can observe it and we will only get the answer it's spinning clockwise or it's spinning counterclockwise. Those are the only two answers we ever get. But when we're not looking at it, it can be in a superposition. It's not that it's in one and we just don't know, it's really in some combination of both. And so that measurement of the electron changes its state dramatically and instantaneously. And, and that's what we don't agree on what that really means. That's the quantum measurement problem. Mm. But if you have two electrons, they can be entangled with each other. So a famous way that they can be entangled is both electrons have the property that you don't know what you will get if you measure their spin. Maybe it's clockwise, maybe it's counterclockwise, but you know that they're opposite. Mm -hmm. You know that if you measure one to be clockwise, the other one will be counterclockwise and vice versa. So that's something that you can try to experimentally test and people have. More Nobel Prizes were given for that also. And when you make that measurement, when the wave function collapses, as we say, before you didn't know, before you were in a superposition of clockwise and counterclockwise, and they were entangled. But after 
Now you know. Now this one is clockwise, that one's counterclockwise. They're not entangled anymore because entanglement is this kind of thing that makes a prediction about the future that is not inherent in what you know right now. But once you've measured them, you know exactly what they're doing. They're separate particles. So measurement breaks entanglement. And this idea of decoherence is basically the modern view of what measurements are, namely that when the when the system itself keeps bumping into the environment around it, right, the photons and the air molecules in the room, that basically acts like a measuring apparatus and that collapses the wave functions of the electrons and so forth, and you break the entanglement of various systems. Well, right here in Silicon Valley, basically um, quantum computing. So is this, uh, you know, the two different spins and the entanglement being used for trying to come up with better computers and faster computers? Or at least this is it, at there's the... a big, instead of just yes or no, you know, one or zero. Yeah. yeah. This idea is at the heart of why it's hard to build quantum computers. <laughs> because indeed, quantum computing makes use of both of those crucial features of quantum mechanics. Number one, that systems can be in superpositions. Mm -hmm. So rather than having a bit that is either zero or one, you can have a quantum bit, a qubit, that is in any combination of zero and one. So that's a lot more information in some sense. And when you have two qubits, they can be entangled with each other and three and four, et cetera. And you can take advantage of that. That gives you more to work with when you're building a computer, more to do processes on, to run algorithms on, and so forth. The problem is that, as we just said, bumping into the rest of the world tends to ruin the entanglement. It mm -hmm. tends to lead to decoherence and break the entanglement between different qubits. So if you want to build a quantum computer, you have to shield your qubits from the entire outside world. Generally, this involves tuning them down to some small number of degrees above absolute zero, keeping them in special containers and, and things like that. They're trying very hard to build sophisticated things that are more robust, but it's hard to keep a bunch of qubits entangled and safe from the outside world, safe from decoherence. So it's easier to ruin a, a, a uh, quantum computer than just spilling your drink on, on uh, your regular computer right now. You, yeah, just shine a light Everything on ruins it. it. You'll ruin it, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be the insurance company that took care of that. You know, replace your computer if it got ruined because they're expensive. There's a lot of money that. going into making sure that no one can do that, so we'll see at least. <laughs> All right, here's another question. Is nature fundamentally discrete or continuous? Is the fabric of reality, David Deutsch says, discrete? There are no measurable continuous quantities in physics, but what, if quantum, what about quantum field theory? Well, we don't know is the honest answer, because when you say, is nature fundamentally discrete or continuous, you're asking about the fundamental nature of reality that we don't have a strong grip on right now. Mm -hmm. But according to quantum field theory, mm -hmm. nature is continuous. That's completely clear. And quantum field theory is currently the best theory we have for describing nature. It's very likely that it won't be the final theory. We don't have a good way of fitting gravity into quantum field theory, and gravity is important. <laughs> so we'll see what things turn out to be. But most legitimate attempts to imagine what a fundamental theory of nature would be like involve continuous things, not discrete things. Again, in, in, in pop culture, in pop description, you've gone, you went into this in your book too. Um, the idea of virtual particles, as if popping in and out, do they really exist? You kind of uh, talk about it in different ways. But if they really do exist in some way, don't they violate the law of conservation of, uh, of energy and momentum? You know, if, they, if, if, if things can be created and destroyed like that um, and even not and affect things but not really be part of them at the same time, it would seem like that would get in the way of that law, which, which might be an incorrect law. We, we, we're just, it's only 400 years old. <laughs> Well, we have to be careful and, you know, people are careful in this game. That's why it took 100 people to invent the standard yeah. model of particle physics. But the short answer is no. Virtual particles do not violate the rules of energy conservation and momentum conservation, but they obey them in weird ways. The energy that a particle can have, a virtual particle, which means in this case, 
a particle that is sort of mediating an interaction mm -hmm. between other particles. Real particles are ones that we can create and then observe. But in between, when the things are interacting with each other and really what's going on is that quantum fields are vibrating, mm -hmm. you shouldn't even be talking about particles at all. Turns out you can talk about particles if you're careful about it, virtual particles, but those virtual particles don't satisfy the usual rules. They do satisfy energy momentum conservation, but the relationship between energy and mass for virtual particles is completely different mm -hmm. from what it would have to be for real particles. Great answer, and it's, it reminds me a little bit of this, you know, ab about the black holes. We don't know really what goes on behind this screen, and so we kind of don't know really what goes on with these virtual particles and how real they are or not. But they're obviously having an effect. So, you know, it's it. What we know and what we don't know is a tricky one here mm -hmm. because we have some mathematical techniques for turning the ideas of quantum field theory into experimental predictions. And those experimental predictions have been tested to enormous precision, and they always come out right. Mm -hmm. So clearly, we're getting something right when it comes to quantum field theory and nature. But there's still fundamental questions about what is going on behind the scenes, under the hood, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And we kind of disagree, uh, different working physicists, about those questions. So. Whether we like it or not, we have rules that work, even if we can't explain exactly why they work. <laughs> What's the scariest thing about quantum fields and why should it keep me up at night? <laughs> <laughs> you Great should question. not lose any sleep over quantum fields. That's, you know, there's lots of scary things about them, but certainly not anything that would make you lose sleep. The scariest thing about them is that they should have more energy than they do. That's the scariest thing about them. Remember, we said even in empty space, mm -hmm. there are still fields, right? And those fields can carry energy. We have very good reason to believe that in empty space, quantum fields are in their lowest energy states. But what is that energy? It's still That doesn't mean it's zero energy state. It means it's the lowest possible energy state. And it seems that experimentally the energy is not quite zero. That we think is the dark energy that is making the universe accelerate that was discovered back in 1998 by astronomers. Mm. The problem is when as theoretical physicists, we sit down and try to work out what the amount of energy should be that quantum fields have in empty space, we get a much, much bigger number than what we actually observe. Mm -hmm. That might not scare you, but as a working theoretical physicist, that keeps me up at night. <laughs> All right, but they, they, nobody needs to worry about being a virtual particle that pops in and out of existence if they wake up in the morning and they, they, they're, they're not going to be gone. There are enough things to worry about. Worry about bears. Those are much more dangerous. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, how certain are you that the laws of physics will be, continue to be valid? Can we be sure that tomorrow will look like today? Oh, wait a minute. Um, no, I can never be sure. That's the great thing about being a scientist. It teaches you you can never be sure mm -hmm. about anything, about anything empirical about the world, because tomorrow you could do an experiment that shows your ideas were wrong. So you have to get comfortable with the idea of being pretty confident in something, even though you're not sure. Like it would be terrible to go through life having no idea what the world was going to do, you know, to think that when you walked out the door, you didn't know whether gravity would be attractive or repulsive, mm -hmm. right? That would really be a hard way to live your life. You think that gravity is attractive. You think that apples fall from trees for very, very good reasons. Can you be sure that gravity will still be attractive tomorrow? No, you cannot. You got to live with both of those facts. So it's a little like the sun is bound to rise tomorrow, but of course, five billion years from now, it just might not because it'll be gone or something. You know. Well, or tomorrow it might not because yeah. we just don't know, but the chances are good that it will still be there. Yeah, no, again, not something to worry too much about. Don't, don't lose sleep. Yeah, yeah. And we're, no matter what people are doing to increase the longevity of our lives, it's probably unlikely to get us to the point where the sun won't rise in the tomorrow. Worry about climate change, not about the laws of physics changing tomorrow. Great, okay. Very good example. Um, do you think there's a need for physics laws to be modified so that we can fit consciousness into physics in order to solve the hard problem of consciousness? 
I personally don't think so. This is another thing that people disagree about. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. Um, I'll say two things. Number one is, of course, we don't understand consciousness. Mm -hmm. What right do we have to think we should understand consciousness? Consciousness emerges from the human brain, which is arguably the single most complex structure that we know about in the entire universe. Given that science as a whole is not finished yet, consciousness is likely to be one of the last things that we eventually figure out. So the fact that we don't understand consciousness perfectly isn't that much evidence for or against anything. The other thing is the temptation to somehow change or alter or modify the laws of physics to help us better understand consciousness is a temptation. But show me the money is my answer to that. Show me how you're going to change the laws of physics in order to better account for consciousness. I've seen zero, even halfway persuasive attempts to do that. <laughs> the laws of physics are kind of unforgiving in this respect. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it wouldn't seem that that's the way to, to go about understanding consciousness anyway, is to, to alter other things so that we can, our prejudices can fit, um, you know. Yeah, I think that when you lose your car keys mm -hmm. in the morning, when, you know, you came home a little tipsy the previous night, you don't go buy a new car. That's like the, not right. the first thing right. you do. There's a simpler place to look. You know, you just like <laughs> your car keys better, right? So exactly. throwing out the laws of physics just because you don't understand consciousness sounds like a way over dramatic step. Good. <laughs> so uh, this goes to, to the, the same sort of conversations that you, you, you just uh, related to. I really enjoy, this is the question, I really enjoy your Mindscape podcast. Do you have a wish list of anyone you would like to still like to interview? They did not give a name. Oh, yeah. I have lots of people I still want to interview. Some I already have, and they're in the can. But I have a policy that I never talk about future guests because both because, you know, maybe I invited them and they didn't want to come. Right. And that's fine. That's their right. Or maybe for some reason or other, I don't want to invite them. So I don't want anyone to get either a good idea or a bad idea about people who I have not had as guests. I think you got to live in anticipation of who the next fun guest might be. Why aren't you running for president with that kind of political skill? <laughs> <laughs> who in the world would want to do that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, there's quite a few people who would, but it's, uh, we can question, question their sanity. Um, so uh, you mentioned climate change as something uh, to be interested in uh, and, to, and to pay attention to. And uh, I'm going to use the last question for that. Um, I want to, it's not in your book, it's not in, but obviously it's very important to hear from scientists in all different fields what they think about what's going on and how crucial it is and, and can we adjust, like, can you, can you, do, you, do you adjust the planet to fit our needs <laughs> when we're talking about consciousness and the laws of physics or is there something that the laws of physics are telling us that we, we really ought not to be doing this? Um, and we should pay attention to it right, right away. So, Well, the laws of physics help explain why we are heating up the planet. We're you know, putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and physics can help understand why the visible light can come in, but the infrared can't get out. That's what's heating us up. But you don't need quantum mechanics or quantum field theory to understand the climate change or the threat that it poses. What you need is a better understanding of human psychology to understand how we can see so clearly that this disastrous thing is happening and yet remain somewhat reluctant to do what it takes to fix it. We could do what it takes to fix it if we wanted to, but we human beings are sort of trained by evolution to think on at most timescales of the lifespan of a human being, right? Mm -hmm. Decades. But as soon as something happens more slowly than that, no matter how bad it is, we can't really get worked up about it. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of not built to deal with problems like this. And climate change is only one example. We're now at a level of technological capability that we can ruin the planet in all sorts of different ways. And we are not very good at working to mitigate those risks. So I hope you put a little bit more effort into that. On those risks of, of, of destroying the planet, a lot of people, this is another big issue that people are worried about, obviously, and, and, and for real reasons, um, nuclear weapons. So we know how many nuclear weapons there are. We think we do. Somebody's maybe hiding some and so on. If, and, and you hear the numbers. Um, 
Well, you, you talk about this, not, not this particular topic, but in your uh, chapter on scale, which I thought was fascinating, I just wanted to mention before we go back to this, because I thought it was great to show um, how big a human is um, from an exponential point of view and how big the universe is compared to the galaxy just from an exponential point of view. It's, it, the number looks close, but it's 10 billion you know, size yes. bigger because, because the exponent. But, but that aside, when people think about the nuclear weapons, they think somehow we could blow the entire planet up. And what I, I think because of movies and everything, what they think is, you know, the core will be, will be, will be destroyed and pieces of, of the earth will go sailing in all directions. Now, from a physics point of view, if you, if you exploded every single one of the nuclear weapons, um, it would not blow the planet up and make it fall apart, I assume. Um, it would, it would ruin the air, it would ruin this, it would ruin that. But the, the planet, it, it would take a lot more energy than that to actually make it no longer look like a planet, right? Or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I guess that's um, a little bit of comfort in a comforting <laughs> world. Um, it'll, still, it'll look like a planet, more like Mars or something like that with nobody on it, right? Millions or hundreds of millions or billions of people would die, but the Earth would still be here, yes. Yeah, okay. So we, we're, we're not quite at the point yet where we have the power to just completely destroy our planet and, and break it into little pieces. Not yet. No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> well, don't work on anything that gives us that information. <laughs> I'm not, I'm very much more conceptual than that. Nothing that I do is going to help or hurt people very directly. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Sean. It was really a great conversation um, and a great book. So thank Thanks you very much, much uh, for uh, joining us today. And so ends, oh, and let me, uh, one thing I want to say, oh yeah, if you uh, want to encourage more uh, conversations like this, you can donate at commonwealthclub.org. This is Commonwealth Club World Affairs of California, and so ends another event in its 122nd year of enlightened discussion. Thanks for joining us, Sean. Enjoy your next interview that you have lined up for a little later. Thanks very much. <laughs>